Hi, Dr. Facentini. Good to have you here. We're going to just do a little brief interview about the Anxiety 101 webinar you did, ask you some follow-up questions. Great. Thanks, Peyton. I'm, I'm real happy to be here and uh, talk with you. So first of all, just generally, um, given that we're kind of aiming this at youth and adolescents, uh, how does anxiety kind of present in younger folks, you know, that might be different from um, adults? Um, so anxiety presents typically the same across all ages, but there are some certain specific things to look for. So when we think about anxiety, we're thinking typically it presents in three ways in terms of physical symptoms like heart beating faster, feeling nervous or, um, you know, sweaty. Uh, we think about thoughts like thoughts of bad things happening or worries. And then we think about behaviors, which can be sometimes avoidance or trying to run away from something or um, sometimes freezing. Uh, sometimes even just getting very angry and feeling the need to escape from a situation. So in um, very young children, they often aren't able to describe what's happening. So they're more likely maybe to cry or run for, for mom or dad or somebody, maybe have a tantrum, because they may not understand the feelings in their bodies. It can be really scary to all of a sudden have your heart beating really fast and worried thoughts. Adolescents, teens, it's um, usually they understand what's going on. You know, I'm, I'm really nervous or this is really frightening me or making me nervous. I can, I can understand why this is happening. Um, but still the physical symptoms like feeling panicky or short of breath or heart beating really fast can be very frightening. Like I think I'm gonna die or have a heart attack or something's really wrong with me. And even adults too, when they get these physical, like these panicky symptoms, it can be terribly frightening. Um, adolescents, um, may not always have the opportunity to escape from a situation. Certainly you can't go to mom or dad and, and cry and ask for help the way a young child um, can do it. But adolescents still um, that are anxious or feeling frightened about a specific situation or person or an event or whatever, they may try to avoid or escape. Like I, I have to leave this party. Um, I don't wanna be here. I'm really afraid of raising my hand in class or getting called on. So I need to, I need to go to the nurse's office to escape. That's nice. So, so basically, it's going to be the same experience regardless of your age. It's just kind of different in how the behavior manifests in response to those experiences. Right. And it's also the level of intensity because we're all, everybody gets nervous or anxious. Anx anxiety is one of the most common elements of things that we feel. It really, it's nature's car alarm. You know, anxiety tells us that, that we think something bad is going to happen, like we're afraid of a threat or something like that. And that's what triggers our anxiety response. And it happens to everybody, you know, many times a day, little things, you see something move, you hear a sound, some big person's coming at you, there's a dog barking, the teacher's going around the room looking for someone to call on. We always, we feel these things all the time. And why I say car alarm is because when everybody's heard car alarms, right? And uh, when was the last time you heard a car alarm and somebody was actually stealing the car? Exactly. Yeah, very rare. Pro probably never or very rare. Yeah. That's what anxiety is like. It makes us think that something dangerous is going to happen, like, like a car is getting stolen, but really it's not. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, you talk about how anxiety is like a normal part of life. Um, and so the point at which it becomes more of a you know, disorder or a, a clinical issue. Like, how can I, as a adolescent or a younger person experiencing anxiety, um, how do I know the point when I need to start seeking treatment? That's a great question. So the point at which you might want to start seeking treatment or thinking there may be a problem really depends on the degree to which anxiety is interfering with your life. Or, or causing problems, or really leading to a lot of distress or upset. So we all again have, ang we all have anxious symptoms at times, and usually we're able just to get through them. But if the anxiety starts lasting longer, if it's more intense, if it pops up for no reason, all of a sudden you start getting panic attacks and you're not really sure why, or the thoughts of bad things happening, or negative outcomes, really your, your heart, it's having a heart, you're having a hard time shaking those thoughts. That can be a sign that maybe the anxiety is more than normal. 
And when we really start to think about anxiety in terms of maybe needing some help or talking to somebody, if the anxiety starts interfering, so not wanting to go to school, avoiding social events, maybe giving up hobbies that you used to like, so playing soccer. If all of a sudden I'm afraid, I don't want to go to my soccer, you know, play my soccer game because I'm afraid I might make a mistake or people might laugh at me or something bad will happen. When you start avoiding things that you like to do or that you need to do, like school, that's when we think there's starting to be a problem. I see. That makes sense. And um, if anxiety is kind of more so than normal, if it is kind of becoming an issue like that, um, However, if the process of seeking help or looking for some sort of treatment is a source of anxiety in itself, uh, do you have any kind of recommendations or advice on how to overcome that? Well, if somebody's anxious about being anxious and then they need to go think they need treatment, that's going to make them really anxious as well, because that's kind of a scary proposition meeting new people. And the treatment of anxiety oftentimes involves exposure, something called exposure therapy, where um, we gradually expose our patients to the things that make them nervous or frightened. And over time, you know, but, but we give them school skills or tools to manage that. So over time, they learn, even though this scares me going to this party or playing soccer or seeing a big dog, even though it scares me, I've learned tools that I can manage my anxiety and I can get through the day and I can and I can do the things that I want to do. I'm not going to let anxiety interfere with my life anymore. So um, when faced with the need for treatment, which can be can be difficult to do, um, the important thing is to talk to parents or another trusted adult, uh, maybe even talk to peers, you know, about this if you're comfortable doing that. Um, and then there are a number of things like online on the CARES Center website, there are a number of exercises and tools that we have for helping manage anxiety. For example, like deep breathing or meditation or mindfulness that can be really helpful in times of anxiety. So if I'm feeling really nervous or frightened and I'm really, it's really bothering me, if I sometimes if I just take a, a few seconds and just do some deep breathing, you know, kind of slow in, slow out, focus on the breathing. That can be enough just to calm down enough to think more rationally or, or more effectively about, about something. But treatment can be very helpful and it is it, it can be kind of frightening and you need to be willing and motivated to do that, motivated to want to, to, want to get past your anxiety. So it's a trade-off. You, you need to have more anxiety at the beginning to have less at the end. Right, yeah. So essentially, you know, whether regardless of like how the extent to which that anxiety is affecting you, there are resources out there, which is is good, right? Because, you know, if um, there are ways to help yourself, even if you don't, you know, go see a professional about it, there are these resources online that you can find to kind of try to self-regulate and see how much that works, right? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of stuff online that you can use to help regulate your anxiety. It's not going to cure your anxiety. It may not, it may not be enough so that you may, don't need to go to treatment, but it, in a pinch, it can really be helpful. Yeah, and that, that's good to know uh, that those resources are kind of always there. Um, and so going more into the, the treatment side of things, you talked about in your presentation how anxiety is very rarely treated compared to some other disorders and um, psychological issues. Uh, could you shed some light on that or some ideas as to why that might be? Yeah, it's very interesting because anxiety is the most common mental, mental health problem in children, in teens, and in adults. About one in five individuals um, suffer from anxiety that may be problematic. And if you think about a typical classroom, of 30 kids or even 40 kids, that's a lot, that's a lot of um, teens or younger children that, that are suffering from, from anxiety. Um, one of the reasons that it's not treated very often is that people think anxiety is just normal and they don't recognize that it can be as problematic because everybody feels anxious. You know, you go, you talk to an adult and you say, I feel nervous about things. They like everybody feels nervous. You know, little kids, they don't like to sleep in the dark. They're afraid of ghosts. You know, older kids, they're maybe afraid to go on the roller coaster because it's scary or, or talk to um, a boy or a girl they like, you know, to ask them out. 
because it's really, really kind of scary to do these things. So anxiety is really very normal. And people think just because anxiety is normal that people with anxiety problems, these problems are also not really problems. So a lot of what we try to do is to educate people that anxiety can be a significant problem and it needs to be treated. I see, yeah. So it is it, it kind of going back to the knowing when to seek treatment sort of thing. Like a lot of the time it's just sort of a misunderstanding or not really acknowledging the full extent to which anxiety is having an impact on your life. Yeah, correct. It's this is really you need to understand that anxiety can is normal, but it can be problematic. And so many adults, even so many doctors, don't recognize or teachers don't recognize that that anxiety can be problematic when it's extreme, and um, that it's important to do something about that. Very nice. So um, you talk about um, in regards to you know strategies to deal with your anxiety. You mentioned uh, CBT. And components of that are, you know, challenging your irrational and anxious thoughts. Um, and so in the moment, you know, when you're having a, a spell of more intense anxiety and those anxious thoughts, you know, in the moment, they might seem rational. It might be difficult to, you know, say that, oh, this is an irrational thought that I have to challenge. What advice can you give to be able to recognize which thoughts are irrational in the moment and which ones are normal? That's a very good question. So... It is hard to tell the difference between a rational thought and an anxiety triggered thought. You know, if I see a dog walking up to me and I say, that dog is gonna bite me. I mean, if I'm anxious, I might believe the dog is gonna bite me. So, you know, one of the things that we, that we teach um, our patients to, to, to do in situations like that is to look at the dog. You know, is the dog wagging its tail? Is it, does it look happy? Is it walking up slowly to you? You know, these might be signs that the dog wants to play. Is the dog snarling or is it baring its fangs? Is it running at you like it's gonna lunge? Those might be the signs that the dog wants to bite you. So you can usually see the signs of what's happening um, and trying to determine whether something is anxiety provoking or not. But our anxious voices in our heads are pretty strong. And, you know, a lot of a lot of the um, teens that I work with, they say, I know it makes no sense. I know it's probably not really dangerous, but in my mind, I think it's dangerous. And my mind is telling me that it's dangerous and it's hard to ignore these thoughts. So one of the first steps in treatment is helping people recognize that the thought is an anxious thought. And that doesn't mean that you, you need to start, just stop thinking it because that's not really realistic. You can't just make a thought go away. But what we want to teach is I'm having an anxious thought. This is bothering me. Deep down, I really don't think this is, this is um, I don't really think that this is accurate. I think it's my anxiety telling me something is dangerous. And I feel anxious. But in spite of that, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. I'm going to continue talking to people. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to do whatever it is. And I'm just going to learn how to tolerate my anxiety or manage my anxiety. That's good. So there, there is kind of a level of awareness in the moment, even when anxiety is bad. There is kind of a possibility to recognize these thoughts are irrational. Yeah, the ability to recognize anxious thoughts as irrational or not true or coming from anxiety most people have that capacity, but it may take a little bit of time thinking about it or with therapy to really get good at it. And the older you get, so adolescents should be better able to do this than younger kids. And then adults are, are even better because they may have had more experience trying to do this. Got it, nice. Um, and so you offer a lot of these strategies um, for parents to help um, their kids going through anxiety and whatnot. Um, but as a teen, what can you do if your parents are kind of not interested in helping with these strategies or not interested in researching about it, or maybe kind of carry some of the stigma against mental illnesses? Like what resources are out there or what things would you recommend to do as a teen who's suffering and you know wants help, but their parents aren't really willing to give that? Yeah, there are situations in which the, the teen might be anxious and recognize the need for help, but the parents don't agree with that. 
or, or may say, oh, you're not really anxious for whatever reason. So there are a couple of things to do. One would be if you have a trusted teacher or counselor at school, because most school personnel are familiar with, with anxiety, especially the counselors or school psychologist or school nurse might be somebody to talk to. Um, there are a number of different, if you go online is one of the best places to get information. Although when you go online looking for information about anxiety, there are a lot of different opinions and some of the information can be valuable or very helpful. And some of it can be not helpful and some of it can might actually be damaging. So you wanna look for a trusted resource. So the CARES Center website is a trusted resource. We are very careful about putting accurate information up. There are some other sites too. There's an organization called the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, or the website is adaa.org. That can be very helpful as well. And you want to um, find information um, that is that can explain to you what anxiety, you know, where it comes from, what keeps it going, and what effective treatments are. And the effective treatments are cognitive behavior therapy or CBT, exposure therapy, and some mindfulness techniques like um, like mindfulness or med meditation, deep breathing, things like that. So if you're on a website, these are the, these are some of the things that you want to look for to help you know that this is gonna be a helpful helpful place to get information. That's good, yeah. So they're, again, going back to the, to say, talking about how there are resources out there, you just have to kind of be a little self-driven and look for them if, if you need them, right? Mm -hmm. And when you go to websites, if you read information and it sounds too good to be true, take this, take this one pill, do this one thing, buy this one product, it's probably not gonna help. That's good to know. <laughs> I'm sure that catches many people. Um, and so how can you, what do you, what do you think are some of the best ways to like, if I have a friend who is going through anxiety right now and I want to support them, how can I, how can I be a good friend? Um, the best way to be a good friend to somebody who is experiencing problems with anxiety is to listen, uh, listen in a non-judgmental way. Um, and encourage your friend to either find some of the resources uh, that we've spoken about, to find resources like the Care Center website or the adaa.org website, to talk to a teacher, to talk to a counselor, to talk to their parents, um, and just really to get, to get some additional information and support. Nice. And is there, is there any way that anxiety can like because it is kind of a normal human response to things at times um is there some way that in which anxiety can be used in like a productive way or channeled into something productive that's a great question so can anxiety be used in a productive way definitely because for the, there's a couple of ways one anxiety protects us if we didn't have anxiety and we didn't ever were afraid of anything, we may all go out into the middle of the 405 and start playing Frisbee between the trucks in the middle of the night. Not very good, right? Anxiety keeps us from doing things that are dangerous. You know, so that's really important. But anxiety can also motivate us to do certain things. So um, like needing to study for a test, you know, or reaching out and trying to do something something different. You know, anxiety can make us stronger because anxiety presents a challenge to us at times and we can overcome the challenge that makes us stronger and it makes us more confident. So anxiety really can motivate us to do things that we need to do, like practice for sports, to study for school, to reach out to others, even though these things might make us nervous on some level. If we weren't feeling anxious, we might not feel the need to do these things. Yeah, that's very interesting. I do remember reading somewhere that um, adolescents with anxiety tend to be kind of at the top of their class in terms of academics and do be very on top of their work. Um, yeah, definitely. So anxious kids oftentimes perform much better and perform more in school because the anxiety makes them study more. Right. Um, and so I think probably one more last question here. Um, are there any kind of 
broadly speaking, cultural differences in anxiety or how, it, how the behaviors might manifest or the processes of experiencing anxiety across cultures that you know of? Um, there, there may be some. Um, there's been a little bit of research, not a lot. Uh, some cultures may be, may be um, less assertive or less aggressive. Um, you know, you know, people that may be quieter, people that may be, be more louder, for example. Um, and in some cultures and, and groups, anxiety might even be considered more, more normal in some senses. You know, in, in the U.S., I think, and in Western culture, people tend to be more assertive and uh, really pushing, pushing things, you know, in, in a lot of ways. In some other cultures, it's, um, you don't want to make waves in as many ways. So um, in Scandinavian cultures, you know, there are, there are things, you know, don't, don't draw attention to yourself. In some Asian cultures, it may be a little bit more like that as well, though not everybody, we're just talking in general, right. um, that um, being quieter, being a little bit more reserved. Um, so, but, but by and large, everybody's, everybody is unique, everybody's individual, and regardless of, of whatever culture or group or part of the world that you're from, anxiety does exist, and it can be problematic. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I think that's about it for the interview. Thank you very much again for doing this. It was my pleasure and a great, great questions, Peyton.